Okay, you are live, Chair Kuznick. Thank you very much, and welcome to the Joint Committee between the Housing Advisory Committee and the San Ramon Planning Commission. We we'll call the meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. And prior to roll call, the city attorney would like to make an announcement to the Planning Commission and the Housing Advisory Committee regarding the teleconferencing of this meeting. So we turn to our Assistant City Attorney, Ms. Alicia Poon. Thank you, Chair Kuznick. Prior to roll call, I would like to make clear for the record of this meeting, and it should be reflected in the minutes, that the governor has issued executive orders relaxing the requirements pertaining to remote meetings under the Brown Act. The executive orders authorize this planning commission and housing advisory committee to hold public meetings by teleconference during the COVID-19 crisis. I previously went over the specific provisions of the Brown Act that have been temporarily amended or suspended in order to allow for this meeting to take place by teleconference. And this meeting will comply with all such provisions. Madam Recording Secretary, it would now be appropriate for you to conduct roll call, after which I would ask the chair to recognize me in order to confirm certain matters for the record. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. Okay, tonight we have Commissioner Edwards. Present. Commissioner Marks. Here. Commissioner Wallace. I'm here. Vice Chair Alpert. Here. Chair Kuznick. Here. Committee Member Bate Chucheka. Here. Thank you. Member Hurley. Here. Member Love. Here. Vice Chair Buckner. Here. Thank you. And I think we are waiting for Chair Kukreja still. Hi, I'm here just oh, hi. getting my setup done. Awesome. Thank you. We're all here. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we return to Ms. Poon for additional matters for the record. Thank you again, Chair Kuznick. I would now like to ask the chairs, the vice chairs and the other commission and committee members three questions. And rather than ask you to respond separately to these three questions, I'll ask all three. And if the answer is yes to all three, please say yes and physically raise your hand. Question number one, can you hear me well? Question number two, have you been able to hear all previous speakers, including the roll call, clearly? And question three, are you satisfied based on facial or voice recognition or otherwise that everyone here representing themselves to be a commission member is actually the person they are representing themselves to be? I'm looking for hands and yeses, please. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing all hands raised and hearing yeses, the record should reflect that I have received affirmative answers from each commission and committee member present to all three questions, that all commission and committee members have indicated that they're able to hear each other and these proceedings clearly. And no commission or committee member has expressed doubt that each and every commission or commi committee member participating by teleconference is in fact the commission or committee member they are representing themselves to be. And finally, I would now like to advise the chairs and the commission members and committee members that the and the recording secretary any votes taken during the teleconference portion of this meeting must be taken by roll call. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Poon. Appreciate it. We, we move on to item two, new business. That is item 2.1, the Joint Planning Commission Housing Advisory Committee study session, existing trends and conditions workbook, housing element adoption schedule, and the housing site inventory. And this presentation will be provided by uh, Ms. Yee. And so Ms. Yee, you have, you have the floor. Great. Thank you so much. I am going to start off by sharing my screen. And then, oh, wrong page. Let me stop the share one second. working off of three different screens here. Is that the right? It looks like the right screen. Looks um, right screen. Okay. It's hard and sometimes with these presentation modes. Okay, I am going to go ahead and get started here. Um, again, 
The purpose of tonight's meeting is to provide um, some updates to the existing conditions and trends workbook, um, the housing element schedule, and the um, primary discussion is really related to the housing element site inventory. Um, as detailed in the staff report, the existing trends, uh, conditions and trends workbook is a snapshot of the current conditions in Saramone. It's really telling a story of Saramone, um, where we've been, where we are today, and uh, the trends that we expect to shape the future of Saramone. This trend um, and conditions workbook will be posted on the project website. Uh, by the end of this month. So keep an eye out for the uh, workbook at planceremony.com. As far as the housing element schedule, we've touched on this previously in our other um, study sessions, but wanted just to highlight um, some recent changes to state law, which now uh, requires us to have a more compressed schedule um, requiring uh, minimum public review periods of 30 days and then minimum 90 day um, or a maximum of 90 day review periods for HCD's review of the of that draft. And so um, because the city has our unique Measure G um, hearing schedule, we'll have to fit those in um, after HCD's review this summer um, and then ultimately um, adopt that housing element by the statutory deadline of January 31st. There is um, a compliance deadline. Um, if cities have not adopted um, by May 30th, there's a potential for other penalties that are um, uh, identified in, in uh, the new state housing law. And so just to um, bring us back to um, a refresh on the uh, Ceremones Regional Housing Needs Allocation. Um, the Regional Housing Needs Allocation is uh, has been adopted by ABAG and so um, is, is, is final. The number of units that were identified haven't changed since the draft was presented to both Housing Advisory and, and Planning Commission um, late last year. Um, we are still planning for 51, uh, approximately 5,100 units um, over this next eight-year cycle. And so um, that's really the basis for our discussion today related to sites inventory. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Della Acosta. She is with um, Rincon Consultants. She is one of our consultants working on the housing element update with the city. And I'll go ahead and, and pass it on to her as I, I run these slides. Cindy. And just so you're aware, I'm also here with Steve Connor, who's also with Raycon Consultants. Um, so how is the city going to address its RENA? So there's a variety of ways that the city will accommodate the RENA. We started by taking a look at the pending and approved projects, which are referred to as pipeline projects. Um, these are the residential development projects that are expected to be built and occupied during this six cycle planning period. And those can count towards the city's RENA. Uh, we also took a look at the average production of accessory dwelling units, or ADUs, and we counted that towards the production of the RENA. We'll also be reusing sites that were identified in the fifth cycle, the current housing element cycle, that were not developed during this planning period. And then we're, we're doing a site-by-site -site evaluation of vacant and underutilized sites across the city, and we're compiling a list of sites that meet certain criteria, um, like appropriate residential zoning, current use, and age of the structures. And then after all of that, sometimes rezoning is also required to meet the arena. So we'll consider rezoning strategies and look at any sites that we think would be adequate to rezone to allow for residential development. So going a little deeper into the pipeline projects, uh, as I mentioned, these are projects that are currently planned for, that have app active applications with the city and or they're expected to be built and occupied during the six cycle uh, planning period. The units from these projects can count towards the city's arena for this cycle. So the city currently has 12 projects that meet this definition and uh, those projects would yield 2,331 units that we can just take off the top of the arena numbers. 
Housing element also includes an analysis of ADUs, and we look at past trends to estimate how many ADUs would likely be permitted within the next eight years during the life of the housing element. So by looking at those numbers, the numbers of permitted ADUs in recent years, uh, staff believes that San Ramon can achieve a total of 70 ADUs for this planning cycle. So we can also reduce, uh, take that off of the RENA numbers. And then the city can also reuse sites that were identified in the current housing element, but were not redeveloped during the last eight years. So staff is recommending that some sites be removed from consideration for a few different reasons, but there is a total of 1,556 units that can still be yielded from those carryover sites without any necessary rezoning. So after accounting for all of the pipeline projects, the anticipated ADUs, the carryover units, this is where San Ramon currently stands with regards to hitting the arena numbers. So as you can see, we started with 5,111 and we subject, subtract the pipeline projects, the ADUs and the carryover sites from that total. And also keep in mind, we are still in the draft phase. So these numbers are subject to change slightly. And that leaves us with 1,413 units still needed to be filled. So in addition to the 1,413 units, a 20% buffer is recommended for lower and moderate income units to ensure that if sites do develop at above moderate instead of lower and moderate income, we don't have to go find more sites to meet that lower and moderate income requirement. Um, now, because lower income housing is generally a smaller part of a developer's overall project and the criteria that's set by HCD for a site must meet, uh, there's criteria set by HCD that a site must meet to be designated to facilitate that lower income development. Uh, San Ramon should consider planning for enough sites to accommodate to 3,500 units. And then when we, we start to look at zoning and rezoning to meet the lower income arena, there are some, some criteria or some requirements we have to look at. So 50% of the lower income must be in a residential zone. Um, sites that are used to accommodate the shortfall can be zoned mixed use if the zoning allows 100% residential. Uh, sites have to be zoned for a minimum density of 20 units per acre and a maximum density of at least 30 units per acre. And the sites must be between half an acre and 10 acres in size. And they have to be large enough to accommodate at least 16 units. And then projects with 20% affordability uh, must be permitted by right. So they can't go through a discretionary review process. Thanks, Stella. Yeah. So um, where that leaves us this evening and really where we're trying to focus the, the majority of our conversation this evening is related to the preliminary list of housing opportunity sites that is included in your staff report as table five. Um, I've added that also to the slide here. So you can see the, the 26 uh, six cycle sites that uh, staff has identified as a preliminary list of housing opportunity sites for the six cycle. Um, along with the table five is a map uh, as attachment C in your staff report. And it overlays the 26 proposed opportunity sites onto the existing housing opportunity sites map from housing cycle six. So the discussion questions to, that have been provided in your staff report are just um, re-summarized here. Are there any existing housing opportunity sites in the fifth cycle that, that should be either considered for exclusion or modified as a housing opportunity site in the sixth cycle? 
And are, are there any proposed housing opportunity sites that should or should not be a housing opportunity site in the six cycle? So if we can try to um, get as much feedback as we can on, on those two particular questions, that would really help us in preparing our refined list of housing opportunity sites. Um, just a, a highlight of, of the next steps after tonight's meeting, um, we will continue to refine that site inventory analysis. We expect to have another round of um, updates to um, present to the uh, general plan ad hoc committee on February 28th. Um, also uh, a joint study session that we've um, created for um, March 15th with the Planning Commission City Council to get some additional feedback on the site's inventory. And then March 28th, um, another ad hoc meeting. So um, all of this is in preparation for the release of the public draft in uh, spring. So past that those that April sort of time frame, we're expecting to have a public release draft late April, early May. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to the chair if you have questions or comments for, for staff. Okay. All right, so at this point, we asked if there are clarifying questions um, to the, the report that we saw and or our consultant or staff member. So questions before we get into our general discussion, things that can be clarified that you were unsure of. All right, uh, Commissioner Wallace, I see your hand has gone up. Thank you, I tried to do it the official way. Um, I'm gonna ask the consultant this question because she went through the um, a list for the uh, various sites um, that we're looking at. Uh, do you have table four in front of you, ma'am? Table four from the staff report? Yes, ma'am. I do now. Okay, there's a line about middle of the table that says fourth and fifth cycle units where the, far, the farthest right-hand column total says 1,556? Yes, sir. Okay. As I understand it, that is basically a synopsis of the table two, which appears on the prior page because the total numbers uh, match. Am I right? Correct. Okay. Back to table four. Under the cat, uh, column marked very low income, under the line that's fourth and fifth cycle units, you have a number of 406. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And what does that number represent? So that's how many of the fourth and fifth cycle very low income units can be carried over into this cycle. Okay, the next column is low income. You have a number of 200, you see that? Right. right. That represents the number of low income units uh, from the fifth cycle units? Right, fourth and fifth cycle. Right. Okay, and then moderate income is the next column over, and that has 543 units. Okay, Correct. so when I pulled out my calculator, I came up with a total for very low income, low income, and moderate income units for the fifth cycle units of 1,149. Right. Are you including the above moderate income? Nope. nope, just the first three columns. Okay. Okay, now, according to my kindergarten math, those three categories, which are the moderate income, uh, excuse me, the affordable income units that were required by RENA equals 74% of the total units carried over from the fifth cycle. Would you agree with my math? Uh, yes. Okay. Can you explain to me how we got a 74% yield from the 1,500 units carried over from the fifth cycle for affordable units? Um, I think 
Cindy, unless you can dig a little deeper into the, the spreadsheet that the math is coming from there, maybe we can get back to you with that question. Okay. I don't have the full the full spreadsheet there where we're pulling all of that math from. Okay. So uh, we're having an ad hoc committee meeting on the 28th, uh, of which I volunteered to be a member, uh, contrary to what I was told in kindergarten. Um, <laughs> I would like no later than that meeting to have someone explain to me how the number of affordable units that you forecast for the existing uh, carryover units could possibly equal almost 11,150 units when our inclusionary housing ordinance only provides for a 15% must build yield. That's the question I have. And if you can't answer it tonight, okay, but I want that question answered by our next meeting. Second question, I guess you want feedback at the end of the period regarding the potential housing opportunity sites? That, that is how the meeting is, should, should flow, okay. but if you okay. can. Okay, then, then I will. This, um, this is clarifying questions. Okay, that is the, uh, I think the only clarifying question I have. All right, Committee Member Love. I have a, a clarifying question on attachment C, the map. Um, and I'm trying to kind of understand because I've got multiple uh, places with the same number. So I'm trying to attach that to table two. Um, so if someone could, I've got like two 14s, a couple 13s. Uh, if I'm reading the map wrong. Uh, which is very, very possible. If someone could uh, explain that. Yeah, I, I can take that one. So um, there are the numbers on the map that have a blue box around it. Those are the, um, the, the housing opportunity sites for the six cycle. So one through 26 that are on table five there should be a one through 26 in a blue box on table C. There are other numbers that are in black and white circles. Those circles are from the fifth cycle. And so those numbers relate to um, the uh, table, table two that's, um, that shows the existing housing opportunity sites from the fifth cycle. So it's going to be Moving into our sixth cycle, we'll have a combination of fifth cycle sites that are in the circle, and then a combination of, 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 um, of new housing opportunity sites from, from uh, table five that are shown in that blue box. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to kind of brief back what you just told me is that. The boxes are for one cycle and the dots are for another cycle. That's correct. And we showed it all on one map just so that you can get a better sense of all of the future housing opportunity sites potentially and where they are within the city so that um, you can assess, generally speaking, um, where those future units are going to be. There are also X's that are on the map that are crossing out housing opportunity sites that will no longer be carried over into the six cycle. Um, so there are going to be opportunity sites that either have been constructed or staff is recommending to be removed um, that are, are shown in an X. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Albert, you're next. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, Table two, which has the list of all of the fifth and sixth, fifth cycle um, locations. At one time, we thought they were all good housing opportunity sites. That's why they're on the list. And there are 19 of them, but um, roughly 10 of them now show have no carrying capacity. Is it, could you perhaps, Cindy, explain why some of those sites that show capacity no longer are eligible to carry over to the next cycle? Sure. Um, so I'll just go just from the top and pull some samples of table two. Um, and as you're referring to table two, um, for example, site number three, that's listed as Deerwood and Old, 
Crow Canyon Road. That site has a approved project at 500 Deerwood, which then would um, have um, that now has a uh, moved into our pipeline projects. And then the other portion of uh, within that site has been deemed not to be a, a, an appropriate housing opportunity cycle uh, for this next cycle. And so we've moved that to a, a zero as far as um, we're recommending that we're not going to carry over housing opportunity site number three into our six cycle. Um, similarly, housing site eight on table two, that's um, Camino Ramon and Executive Parkway. That's the extent of where um, Bishop Ranch six city village has been approved. So that has now moved into a pipeline project. Um, that site itself has zero units associated remaining for that site. Um, and um, potentially it may come back as a new version in the six cycle where we may reevaluate um, a, a new configuration within that area and then create a new housing opportunity site. So I, I know it, some of these are a little difficult to imagine, but a, a number of these we've either identified as, um, as already constructed or approved and no longer carrying over to the six cycle Chang properties or the, what's referred to as two properties, Doherty Valley, all of those permits have, have either been issued or um, the project's approved. And so primarily all of the ones that are listed uh, with a, a zero as far as future capacity are because they've either moved to pipeline projects or have been constructed. Great, thank you. And then is it safe to say that, like I think you alluded to, some of them that have moved to zero may have some remaining capacity, um, but that's to be determined, is that correct? That's right. So what we know as, as of right now, as a fifth cycle housing opportunity site eight will be a new housing opportunity site number in cycle six. Great. So it'll, it'll have a brand new number. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Cindy. Okay. All right, uh, committee member Bate to check. I'm sorry, I was practicing your name. No, that, that's perfect. Bate to check. Um, Thank you. I apologize. <laughs> oh, no worries at all. It's not an easy last name. Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, it's more of a uh, recommendation for the February 28th meeting that we're going to have. Uh, so the table number five and the map uh, attachment are very helpful. However, it, it would be good to see the existing zoning of the proposed site areas, what their corresponding zones are uh, per the zoning map. And when you say the action rezone, what is that new zone being proposed to be? Um, which uh, category of the uh, residential is it propo uh, proposed to come as? Um, and then um, the last question I have is the DVSP amendment. Uh, can you clarify what that means? Sure. Um, some of these housing opportunity sites are in specific plan areas. And so the action that's identified where it says NCR SP amendment or DV SP amendment, um, they refer to the North Camino Ramon specific plan, which will have to be amended. Um, it's, a, it's a more focused plan for that particular area of the city. Um, and um, that plan will have to be amended in addition to re the rezone that will also have to be done in order to make sure that those two documents are consistent. So for the Doherty Valley specific plan, there, there will need to be an amendment to that as well. Understood, thank you. I have, I have one question. Okay, uh, go ahead, Commander Manor Hurley, you can put your hand up. So with the, with the new housing opportunity sites, um, you know, rough math, if you do the 20% over capacity of the 14, it's like roughly 1700 units. So is there a gross uh, best guess estimate how many units 
these 26 new housing sites get us? Because the question we're trying to, or we're being asked is, should any of these things be excluded? So if we start excluding things, you know, we start sub subtracting capacity, um, where does that get us, I wonder? Sorry, I was just on mute there. I think we we do have some estimates of as to what the what the unit yield would be on on each of these twenty six, um, but what we're trying to get is some high level feedback as far as whether or not these sites are good sites to begin with, um, and then what potential density range we may need to target in order to, to get to those numbers. And so at, in, in total, we're, we're gonna need to pretty much make up 30, you know, um, sites for 3,500 unit um, to, to make the, the short shortage that we have from already planned or pipeline projects. Um, and, and so some of that is dictated by whether or not these sites are, are going to be adequate sites. And then um, 3,500 units will have to kind of divide amongst these, really these 26 plus whatever we're carrying over from fifth cycle. So bet between those two um, numbers, um, we do we we do feel that we have enough sites to get to that 3,500 unit. But if there are major issues that this group sees as a future housing opportunity site, we'll have to take that off the list or amend it, and then come back. I think with a with a, a realistic number of what the capacity will need to be if we're if we add or remove sites from this list. And seeing no other hands, I do have one quick uh, clarifying question. In the discussion about the ADUs, I believe that was in. Table four. Um, this is a, a term that has come up in our meetings. So I just want to clarify definition you're using, which is are we talking about a new independent building on somebody's residential lot? Or are we talking about this concept of, for lack of a better phrase, a studio apartment on the ground level of a townhouse, as we've seen in some of the projects come before us? When we refer to the 70 ADUs that are, are projected for this next cycle, um, those are the types of units that individual property owners are proposing to add on to their, their residential site. So um, you would get a building permit and that's how we would document the, the addition of that ADU. All right, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Okay, um, seeing no other hands come up in this portion, um, what we'd like to do then uh, is uh, we would go to public comment. So we'd like to open public comment and uh, Madam Recording Secretary, if there are any speakers and or late communication items. Thank you, yes, um, no late communication items for this item today. Um, and I do want to remind members of the public that public comment at special meetings will be limited to this item described in the notice. Um, and therefore only public comment related to the agenda item will be heard. And it does look like we have a couple hands raised. Okay. So as a reminder, if you'd like to speak, you can click the raise your hand button on your computer or star nine on your telephone. And we will have three minutes um, for each speaker. So I will pull in our first speaker here who is call in user one. Uh, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and speak. Call in user one, it looks like you're muted. I can unmute you and see if that, Let's see here. All right, looks like they're still muted. Maybe what we'll do, let's move on to our next speaker and um, we'll pull back that caller, user one, um, in just a minute. So for now, maybe we'll bring in our other speaker. Let me see here. 
looks like we have Joyce Carr. Joyce, you can speak whenever you're ready. Good evening. Thank you so much. My name is Joyce Carr. I'm a resident here in San Ramon. I'd like to take a step back from what we've been discussing so far today um, to bring up a topic that I have spoken on before, and I'm bringing it up again because of its extreme importance. I am concerned about our water shortage and how we are going to share the water that we have or will have with the 5,111 new housing units. I've asked a, this question before and I was told that East Bay Mud is responsible for that. My question, one of my questions is, has anybody met with them to discuss the details of the water and how they're gonna meet our water needs? I, I heard on the news a few days ago that we are in the worst drought in over a thousand years. Um, we have a water crisis, we have global warming, wildfires um, that seem to be of the greatest importance, more important than a housing crisis. So what I would like to have at one of your upcoming meetings that you're gonna be having or at a council meeting or a planning commission meeting, I, would, I am asking that someone from East Bay Mud come to that meeting and explain to the residents, to all of us, how they plan on supplying the water for these residents and all of us who, have, have, are, who are current residents. So if I could get an answer on that, that would be great. I would love to hear from East Bay Mud. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and pull in call in user one again. Call in user one, can you hear us? It's my show <laughs> that, that she's muted or that this user's muted. Okay. Um, and I've asked if they can unmute themselves. Um, I'll, I'll try one more time and see if maybe they can make it in here. Okay. Call in user one, can you hear us? Okay. All right, we're gonna go ahead and we'll move on to our next speaker. And that would be Paul Bickmore. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Bickmore, um, and um, I just have um, some comments and questions on some of the sites. Um, not all of them, since I'm not familiar with everything, but um, as I understood, um, the approved units um, at uh, Bishop Ranch 6 um, were um, already going through and the, that the developer wasn't going um, considering extra density. Um, in fact, um, I commented actually requesting more density since um, we are in uh, a severe housing crisis here um, that's um, exacerbating climate change and causing the water crisis that the previous um, um, commenter mentioned. Um, and I'd also like to comment on um, you know, I think, I believe it's site six on table two. Um, again, the ones that I know most about, um, which seems to be um, sites that are either like three-story office buildings with already a lot of density next to a freeway or um, large um, um, big box retail that those things tend to get, um, have really long leases and office space that's owned by, you know, a bunch of just these tiny little um, offices. And um, I, I'm not sure the details on all of those since, you know, I've mainly been following um, Bishop Branch 6, but I'd like to encourage you just um, to ensure that um, when you put these sites down, the you're really looking at the market viability of these things to pencil in the next eight years or so when uh, we have to get this built. Um, because putting, you know, 
putting things down um, is one thing. Actually um, doing things that get things built is another and um, make sure that um, if they're not gonna be viable, then we need to find places to rezone. Um, and, um, and thank you. Thanks, Paul. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. We have Sue Bach. Whenever you're ready. Good evening, Planning Commission. You have a lot of people to uh, communicate with. Um, I have three clarifying questions. Uh, what is the plan for uh, electrification for these for the new, the new buildings, uh, the new housing? And I totally understand with the housing crisis, we actually need them and is mandated by the state. And the other two, uh, second question is concerning what is considered low income and very low income as far as the housing, the 20% that we have to have. I just wanted to clarify how that is concerned with uh, social, just, social inequity justice. So um, I'd appreciate some answers. And I'm done. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great, thank you, Sue. Okay, um, it looks like Colin user one still has their hand raised. I'm gonna to try to bring them in one more time, see if maybe we can hear them. Looks like they're still muted. Okay. All right, so that was our last speaker. Um, Colin user one, if you'd like to send in a comment to us later on, you're welcome to do that. Um, but that was our last speaker. So um, okay. through the chair, we can go ahead and close public comment. All right, let us close uh, public comment. Appreciate that. And um, we're sorry we couldn't work out the technical difficulties um, with our one remaining um, request for comments. So at this time then, um, what we'd like to do is open it up for a discussion amongst our committee members and commissioners. So uh, Mr. Hurley, your hand is up. You're on. Sorry, mute. Um, so, you know, the, the answers, the questions we're, we're looking at are really what should come off. And, and you know, at this point, I, I don't, I, I don't see any reason to take anything off. But what I do see, um, in full disclosure, I used to be on the Transportation Advisory Committee, and I also represent the city on the, the Contra Costa Transit Authority Advisory Committee, Citizens Advisory Committee. So transit is always, you know, one of the things that I look at, you know, right off the bat. So what I see is is a lot of hop housing opportunity in the core of the city, walkable, bikeable to the transit center, um, to Iron Horse Trail, to some elementary schools, middle schools. And what else I see is other housing opportunity sites that are right along existing county connection routes, um, which have been decreased in the last few years um, because of lack of demand. Um, but that's what I see, um, and it's a positive. You, you know, we're trying to reduce vehicle miles traveled, um, reduce greenhouse gases, you know, things like that. And I see a uh, great opportunity. Um, to the, and to the one uh, commenter, you know, I agree, density. I've, I was looking at Summerhill, and if my memory serves me correctly, the smallest home in there was 1,700 square feet. Um, I, I hope uh, some of these housing opportunity sites in the core of the city, we consider some smaller. Um, I live in a small you know, townhouse in the corner of the city. It's 1,100 square feet, perfectly happy. These things sell in seven days. Um, so I, I'd like to see some, uh, some more smaller options in the core of the city where it's closer to transit. Thank you very much. Okay, committee member, uh, Bate Chacheca. Perfect. You okay. got it. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I have uh, multiple questions. Um, first question relating to the sites that uh, are currently used as parking lots. 
are these parking lots that we are proposing to redev redevelop, are they currently being uh, specified for certain buildings and certain uses? If so, how do we propose to replace that parking? Um, and um, uh, in terms of um, uh, if we are going to bring back the parking, I would highly recommend either um, underground parking um, or um, and within a structure that the structure will be have a vegetated roof. Um, trying to um, uh, save water here as much as possible uh, and specifically helpful for rainwater management. Uh, second uh, question is about the tennis court um, option, 7.1 acres. Now, um, my question about that space is that the concern is that we are taking away uh, an area with physical activity uh, that is supposed to help people with physical activity. How do we propose introducing areas that will um, promote um, human health and well-being essentially? So um, back to um, committee member Hurley's uh, point, uh, areas with biking, um, areas that promote uh, uh, walking distances, so things to consider if we are taking 7.1 acre of uh, physical activity opportunities. Um, next question is um, about the warehouse and underdeveloped uh, area, uh, line number 14, 29.6 acres. Now, uh, uh, I believe that is um, in the space between um, kind of nestled between open off, uh, or administrative offices uh, on, uh, on the zoning map. Uh, the concern there, if it is an undeveloped site, um, it will, if there are a few concerns. First concerns, building on an undeveloped site, that's gonna be a lot of infrastructure. That's gonna take a lot of energy. That's gonna take a lot of material. Do we have provisions uh, on those items? Second, the offices around typically pull a lot of electricity and often um, are faced with power shutdowns. Will that impact the housing uh, uh, units that we are proposing to go in their neighborhood? Um, mm, also a clarifying question, are these only going to be administrative offices or that are surrounding this uh, proposed space or do they have data centers as well? Because that is more electrical power pull for the city. So the city, if we are to put um, low income housing, we also need to think about pulling new additional utility, more power and all that infrastructure that will have to be associated with it. Um, and Lastly, I promise it's the last one. <laughs> um, for the vacant uh, spaces, lines 25 and 26, um, in terms of um, the geographical studies, making sure that these lands are um, viable uh, for uh, building uh, on top of them and the amount of work that goes into it. I mean, they are smaller acreage, so I, I can see the benefit of putting more effort into that as they are closer to other infrastructure. However, I think it is important to capture that information in uh, the proposal um, for these sites. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Commissioner Wallace, oh, Mr. Albert, you popped up. And I know I, I deferred you a comment um, previously, so I'm gonna call on you because you didn't raise your hand. Okay, I can take it. Okay. All right, um, what I'm gonna do is go through the list of potential housing opportunity sites. That's what you want is feedback on. And what I'm gonna focus on is the ones that I have um, strong opinions on. There's a number of the housing opportunity sites that I have real questions about uh, why they're on the list, whether they're viable or not, specifically 
uh, line items 10 through 12, which were the executive parkway office buildings. Uh, from an overhead standpoint, I can see why, because it's right across from City Walk. But before I would put a housing opportunity site that size on our list, I would want to have more information about it, and particularly whether the property owner is thinking of redeveloping that property within the next eight years. But let me go, th go through the list of 26 potential opportunity sites. Number one is 2481 Deerwood. We had a concept review for that building uh, last year. And I think the consensus of the planning commission was that it was a viable site. We're converting a commercial space into um, housing. So that would be a pro. The next two, two and three on Omega Road. In looking at the map, it's not clear, but it looks like if they're not in the residential overlay district in the San Ramon Village Plan area, they're, they're pretty close. Items four and five, Charlie Brown, that will used to be Charlie Brown's. Uh, that is a perfect site for an apartment. The problem you're gonna have is how tall it's gonna be because it has an awesome view of the entire valley. Um, you could probably sell a thousand square foot units for a million and a half on that site. Um, six and seven was mentioned by one of the committee members. I believe the tennis courts are at Club Sport. Um, and I don't know the Club Sport's willing to sell them. The vacant lot that's also associated with that address, I couldn't tell from the zoning map either at the county or the city where that is. So I'm going to leave that open. I'm going to jump down to number 13 which is 19001 San Ramon Valley Boulevard. If I'm correct, I think that's Church of the Valley site, uh, which the Planning Commission did have a conversation or two about last year. So I think that is a perfect housing opportunity site uh, with the caveat being that in order to do that, you were gonna have to amend the general plan to reduce or eliminate the creek setback, which I'm sure everybody realizes it's just a walk in the park, no pun intended. Um, number 14, our committee member talked about that. That is the Toyota Warehouse uh, space. The vacant space we've had as a housing opportunity site since time immemorial, it's the warehouse that's been sitting there. So um, obviously that's a perfect place for housing if you want to give up on having destination retail as was proposed in the North Camino Ramon specific plan area. Uh, but in terms of housing, obviously right in the center of the core area of the city, that would be a perfect place for it. Number 15, uh, 2190 Crow Canyon Road. According to the map I looked at, that is the area below 2481 Deerwood. And when we discussed the Deerwood property as a potential housing opportunity site, it seemed to me that we all agreed that that property below uh, Deerwood was unbuildable because of the slope and because of the terrain down there. So unless someone has a better idea about why that could be developed, I don't think that's really a, a good potential site. Uh, number 16 through 19 are all on Crow Canyon Road. Uh, two of them are front the uh, Crow Canyon Road that are sandwiched between Charles Schwab and the Ulta um, a beauty store. Um, 205 and 201 Crow Canyon Place are the backside of Magnolia Square. Two things. One is the North, the, uh, North Camino Ramon specific plan area designates that as commercial space. And one thing I remember from our consultants is that they thought that the commercial thoroughfares in San Ramon ought to be dedicated to uh, commercial use. Uh, which would sort of auger against turning that into housing. But more importantly, you recall at the back side of that building, there's a project going on. It's yep. the Costco gas station. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, all of us sat through six different committee meetings, commission meetings to talking about Costco gas. And apart from the potential for the underground storage tanks blowing up in the traffic, the other thing was, Look how the smell and odors and all those toxic chemicals are going to affect the people down the street in Danville. Mm -hmm. uh, being that is the case, I find it a little bit surprising that someone would disregard the North Carolina specific plant and want to put apartments or 
housing right next to Costco gas after what we went through. Item 20 is uh, on San Ramon Valley Boulevard. It's the area where the, the Eric's Deli Shopping Center is. I am very concerned about stripping out all of the commercial areas in San Ramon to put apartment buildings. I think it's one thing to take down an office building, which generally doesn't generate a lot of, of tax revenue for the city, um, but to take out commercial space uh, I think is a bigger problem. The one thing I would say about Eric's is it's uh, right behind some other housing uh, in Twin Creeks. So there is some justification for at least talking about it. Crow Canyon Cinema, which is item number 21, we've been talking about for years as a potential commercial site that ought to be or could very well be uh, converted to residential. There is residential behind it. There's the Diablo Plaza Shopping Center right next to it. So you have a built-in audience for the Diablo Plaza Center, which we have heretofore kept as a retail site and taken it out of the mixed use category a couple of years ago. Um, item 22 is 2710 Crow Canyon. That's the Staples office store, as I recall. It's in the same parking lot as Home Depot. Um, I realize there's housing on the other side uh, of the entranceway there, but uh, again, I'm not sure that's a really great site for housing, although, again, it's near housing and up the hill to Deerwood has housing as well. Um, items 23 and 24 are office buildings on Crow Canyon Road, and I haven't looked at them, but they're nowhere, there's no housing around them, as I recall, and I believe at least one of them backs up to the creek. So I, I question whether having housing right on that part of Crow Canyon Road is really appropriate. The last two spaces, I know one of the committee members mentioned about that. 25 and 26 are vacant space in Doherty Valley at the south end of the valley. In the, in the Doherty Valley specific plan area, that was designated for a, a community center development. At one time they were talking about a gas station plus a, a small shopping center so that people in Doherty Valley would have some place to go. And for, let me vent for 20 seconds here. The county planned Doherty Valley, 11,000 11, units, that's 40,000 people. That's more than there are in Danville. And when they planned it, they planned absolutely no commercial development in the entire city to support a tax base. They basically made it like Piedmont, a lot of really nice expensive homes and no sales tax or any other type of tax revenue. Um, and so, you know, it's a shame to have to take out that area um, and put it into housing, but we already have the senior housing down there. We have two separate senior housing projects. So um, the county didn't do us any favor the way they planned it, but, you know, given the way things are with the state and having to squeeze in housing wherever we can find it, I would say that in the neighborhood, that's probably appropriate for it. So you asked for comments on the list. So I gave you my, you know, 20 second explanation. Uh, thank you. Anyone else uh, have additional comments? Um, feedback to the staff about the housing sites. I would say that there are a number of, oh, I see hands. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go with uh, Commissioner Marks because you have not spoken so far and then we'll go Committee Member Love and then Commissioner Albert. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to start with the list and then I'll just diverge a little bit. <clears throat> there are a number of properties that were um, mentioned as potential candidates for the list at the first uh, general plan ad hoc or planning commission ad hoc uh, committee meeting that are not on this list. Um, and there's no explanation in the staff report why they are not on the list. I, I don't know that we need to get into that tonight, but at the February uh, meeting of the ad hoc committee, I would like to know particularly about three properties, but all of the properties that were mentioned uh, in January. And those three properties are the center point building on, uh, I think it's 18 um, Omega Court. Uh, what used to be the PG&E Conference Center and is now the San Ramon Valley Conference Center which is within the Bishop Ranch and is a very large piece of property. And 
um, at the intersection of Norris Canyon and Camino Ramon, um, there is the, the uh, Norris Canyon uh, Technology Center, um, which is directly across Norris Canyon Road from where BR6 is being constructed. Um, all of those are, in my view, candidate say, sites. Um, it may be the case that staff has information that the property owners do not intend within the eight year cycle period to do anything with the property, but I would at least like an explanation. Um, I would like to know uh, why um, and when we spoke, not why, but when we spoke to the, the property owners and what they said. And I am assuming that all of the properties on table five we have spoken to and all of those property owners agree that within the, eight, the next eight year cycle, they are uh, either intending to do the redevelopment or putting the property for sale to somebody who would do the, the uh, redevelopment. Um, I'd like to say, before I give you my comments on the list, which will pair it, er, uh, Eric's pretty clearly, um, I didn't approach this from the standpoint of just looking at the properties. Um, I, I think you have to take of a macro view of what's the city gonna be like if all of these develop or if a significant number of these develop, what kind of a city do you have left? Um, all of the prime property can't go toward housing. That is not how you have a diverse, um, self-supporting uh, city. Um, you have to think a little bit about, yes, this property might be a good property for housing, but it might also meet another important city need. And while I agree that we need to meet our arena numbers, and I think the staff and the consultant are doing a very good job so far, um, I'm skeptical about some of the, the properties that are on here um, because they appear to me to do more long-term damage than more uh, long-term benefit. My two guiding principles as I approach this general plan effort, which I announced at the January meeting are number one, keep the higher density housing away from existing residential neighborhoods. Um, and I think we have the ability to do that. And I think the staff and the consultant are, are leading us in a generally a good direction that way. But I, I will be looking at that up relative to every property. The other point that to me is very important is um, I don't want us to destroy our retail and neighborhood shopping base. Um, you can't have a, a city that is meeting the needs of all of its people if your neighborhood shopping centers are uh, becoming substantially housing sites. Um, I do agree with the idea of some mixed use housing in some of the centers, but to go to the list, the uh, Eric's Deli Shopping Center, which is on one side, the movie theater, and on one side, actually Eric's Deli and other stores. I don't have a problem with converting the theater to a housing site. It's not optimal in my opinion, but the fact of the matter is the market is doing that anyway, um, particularly with a lot of young people. Um, if they're anything like my uh, three younger uh, children, they stream everything. Um, they, they, they really don't think going to the theater is all that big a deal. Um, and so I, I would be very opposed to the Eric's Deli side of things being converted to housing. Um, and I would be supportive of the, um, movie theater side uh, with the right kind of, of development uh, being constructed with housing and maybe ground floor uh, retail if that were possible. Um, I, I want to say that the Staples building and parking lot fall into that same category for me. Um, I believe there have to be some areas in the city where you have retail and you have commercial activity. Um, I don't have a problem with the idea that they're on the other side of the Home Depot. People will make that choice um, if, if they wanted to live there if it was housing, but we shouldn't make that choice. Um, we should try to find sites that to the extent possible do not involve retail and commercial um, shopping centers and 
only when we are convinced that we can't meet our numbers, then take a look at some of these other properties. So I, I don't see 2710 Crow Canyon or 2730, the parking lot, as candidate sites. Um, I would agree with almost everything else that Eric said, but I also want to raise a question, and, and this is not a, um, I'm committed to this idea, but it's something that just seems amiss to me, and that is the inclusionary housing ordinance. Um, I, I do not agree at this time with allowing a land development project that's residential to fee out. Um, if, this, if the name of the game is we've got to create as many housing units as possible, I wonder how many units in the past and how many units in the future based on this or whatever the list looks like in the future, how many units we're going to simply say we don't really need um, and we're going to collect fees. Um, I, would, I would remind everybody that the fees don't last all that long the units will last for 55 years, even if it's only three dozen or some other relatively minor number. Um, it just seems to me that it doesn't make sense to do that. And the second side of this is, um, it is my understanding that the fee out in San Ramon is not particularly expensive. It's not, you don't pay all that much. Um, and the numbers I've heard, which may or may not be accurate, don't even, equate to what it would cost to buy a used car. Um, and, and so I, why, if we're going to allow people to fee out, don't we have a very substantial feeing out per unit amount? Um, and I would like information to come to uh, the ad hoc committee uh, regarding how other cities in the Tri-Valley or even on the peninsula, what do they charge if they allow um, uh, developers to fee out how much per unit how much how does that compare to where we are um, i don't claim that i i have all of the knowledge needed to say right now let's let's change the ordinance but i would like some discussion of that because again i feel like we are missing opportunities to do everything we can to reach the arena numbers or at least demonstrate that we've done everything that we can um, those are my comments at this time and um, again, I, I'm looking forward to some information being received at the February ad hoc committee meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Walls, or Marks. Commissioner Albert. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, not to repeat any of the comments on the individual sites, but in general, I have just three comments. One, on the fifth cycle units, I would like to see as much as possible um, information about why they're the current numbers they are, whether it's zero or some other number, just um, because I know the work's been done, I just think we have to be able to look at it. Um, secondly, I do want to call out the two shopping centers that are listed as the fifth and sixth cycle, um, echoing a little bit of Commissioner Marks. Um, I think I'd like a little more information. For example, the marketplace already has a housing project proposed, but the marketplace also includes the hotel site, the sports basement, the gas station, the library. Um, what sites are we considering at the marketplace? Um, that'd be point one, same question on the on Country Club Village. But more importantly, um, I'd be concerned that our ordinances don't um, protect retail as much as we'd wanted to. So I at least would like either part of this process or the cycle before we turn over shopping centers to housing, we're relatively sure that our ordinances will protect the basic retail there and we won't find ourselves losing all important shopping centers. And then my last comment, and I think it's captured, but sometimes it's hard. I think we should do everything we can to encourage housing along Norris Canyon between Bishop and Annabelle to Camino Ramon. Um, we've already started with BR6. Um, the opposite side of the road where UPS and 24-hour fitness and the two-story office buildings, I think are ideal sites for housing. And then when it comes to Toyota, I also remember it being discussed for decades. I'd like us to consider all options to make it very attractive for the Toyota property owner to look seriously at converting it to housing, whether it's density or something else. But I think it's just a, such an ideal site for housing and it matches all of our previous goals of, goals of keeping housing in our core and away from our neighborhoods. And so those are my comments for tonight. Okay, great. 
Uh, and I have a couple of quick comments too. Um, and I know in the interest of time, I will speak quickly. So um, as opposed to going through the list of, of because we've heard um, two very capable explanations of the list, but I would like to ask the question uh, or make the comment that uh, my concern is that our density is being not just limited in the uh, corridor between the freeway and um, Alcosta, but also up in the um, San Ramon Village area, formerly the Crocania specific plan. And I, I, I worry to, to Mr. Um, Commissioner Mark's comment about, you know, how these things live uh, much longer is that, it, you know, I want us to look at where we are putting the density and that we're taking an area that already has a very industrial feel and looking at that as putting in lots of high density places. And um, that really, for me, goes against the grain of our inclusionary housing, which is that we want our housing to feel um, well balanced within the city and that it's inviting to every uh, economic uh, availability and not just limited to one nook and cranny of, of our city. And it feels like this is the direction that this seems to be going. Um, I, I do have a question about uh, numbers uh, four, five, six, and seven, only because it, it creates this question in my mind if we're looking at what used to be a restaurant and a parking lot, why don't the housing sites go all the way across and look at the offices, uh, the medical buildings, a uh, couple of restaurants, um, that whole business site as a potential site, and, and then look at club sport? Um, if we're going to look at their tennis courts, why not look at all of their property and then you know picture housing going from existing housing all the way to the edge of um, well, basically it's kind of a cliff, but um, where, the, where the, the restaurant overlooks the valley. And I agree that could be prime property, um, but, but why not isn't that, that site um, it, as, as a potential housing site? And then finally, um, while my friends in, in South San Ramon um, will probably uh, look for me to, to hang, um, the question is about the golf course property down in South, South San Ramon. Um, you know, it, 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 it's a commercial business. Um, it would require some rezoning. Um, but if we're looking at, you know, tearing down, you know, every office building and, and every retail center, but have acres and acres of a golf course um, untouched, then are we really looking at where we want housing to be? So that was the, the questions that I had um, uh, related to, to the list. So just some curiosity about why things didn't make the list versus um, others that, that, that did. And um, so I hope that was quickly enough for, for everybody. Questions, uh, last final comments among our housing committee members. Uh, Commissioner Edwards, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, mindful again, mindful of the time. Um, I, I do want to just emphasize that I think we need to be looking very seriously at underutilized parcels. Uh, I think Ms. Kuznick's point about the golf course is a good one. Uh, the, the question that I have, and I have not been a party to prior planning commission meetings regarding the golf course, but I think the number one question that we need to be asking with the golf course is who's using it? Is it being used? Who's using it? What is it costing the city? Um, what is the opportunity there um, for redevelopment of that site, if any? Um, we have an awful lot of surface parking lots in San Ramon. Um, structured parking is a really excellent way to, you know, kind of collapse some of those surface parking lots and make some land available. And I am definitely a big fan of mixed use. Um, you know, going to the comments about the Eric's Deli site, you know, I, I do not think that we necessarily have to choose one commercial use versus residential. I do not think that those, those uses necessarily have to compete with each other. I think that through smart planning um, and, and thoughtful, creative projects, I do tend to think we can have both. Um, so I, I just I also want to just take a minute and commend staff for the remarkable work on, on pulling all of this together. Um, I know that this was a lot of work and um, our numbers are daunting. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Edwards. All right, last call. All right, so, so staff, um, we hope that you have um, received enough feedback from 
this um, joint committee uh, hearing on, on this, and we look forward to the next set of meetings uh, we'll be in. And thank you to our two members who are on the ad hoc committee as well for your time and efforts on this, appreciate that. And so seeing no further comments, no hands raised, I'm going to um, adjourn the meeting at 717. Uh, planning commissioners, we will um, take a brief break. So uh, rehydrate, take a bathroom stop um, before we we get back on, on record. All right, sufficient? Through the chair, it's just about a three right. to five minute break. Um, three to five. Folks waiting, it's 20, almost 20 after, so. Okay, um, three to five, all right? So we will log out of this meeting and planning commission uh, to housing advisory committee. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, appreciate it. Staff, thank you so much. All right, I'm leaving. <laughs>